Don't rip them apart. The damage is done. Just let it go. Um, so the male will dismount and turn around, but the penis remains in the female. That's again the tie. And then he continues to ejaculate. So any ejaculation that occurs in this area up here is that's all um, pre-ejaculate. There's very little to no sperm in that. It's just lubricating the female's tract. Um, it's not actually going to contain anything that we want. The tie is where it's going to contain all of the ejaculate that we actually want. And when I collect a male for you guys, you can actually see it. I'll have a bunch of clear liquid first when he starts to ejaculate and that's all the pre. And then you'll start to see it turn like a cloudy white or a milky white color. And that is the sperm rich portion. And that's exactly what we're looking for. And that's happening during the tie. So this is a dog's anatomy. So, um, this is like the, the, there, there's like a, a, a hip joint. So this is a pelvis. And then this is um, just the cremaster muscle, which is, which is just that muscle of the dog's um, penis that helps it extend. Um, bulls have one, sheep have one. Um, and then this is your, your actual um, glands penis. So this is the part of the penis that, that people see. This is what you see a male dog stick out when he pees or something like that. Or somebody says his penis is stuck out. It's usually this little part see, stuck out that you see. This is the bulbous glandus. This, depending on the size of the dog, can get pretty big. So in my coon dog, um, it gets probably this big. It gets pretty large. And so it actually, that's where I, you don't want to pull them apart because that gets stuck inside the female and that causes the tie. So that's, this gets really swollen and gets stuck inside the female and that's exactly what we want. So that's what causes the tie. So this is just kind of showing you here. I have a video here you guys can watch. I suggest you watch it. I know it's kind of weird sometimes to watch, if you think about watching an animal have sex, but um, it's natural, so don't freak out. Um, so this is just the male um, getting off the female. He'll lift his leg up over her and turn around, and now they're tied together. So they're stuck butt to butt, and that is happens in wolves and coyotes. Um, it happens in all the dogs. Not in cats, but it happens in dogs. So anything that's in the canine family, this happens. So this just shows here. Um, so there's your, your coitus, your first stage. Um, the male's penis, that bulbous uh, glandus gets engorged. Um, they flip around and then they stand butt, butt to butt. And that turnaround, um, that can be anywhere from um, five to 45 minutes. It just depends on the male. I would say the larger the dog, the longer they stay tied. Um, and this here shows you um, that the male's penis, the bulbous penis is actually stuck inside the vagina. Um, and it's the, the tip of the penis goes way up towards um, the uterus. And that's where we're looking to deposit the semen. So when we have live cover, we usually want to see them mate twice or more. Um, we usually say, um, once we are seeing the female start to come into estrus, we usually say every other day to make sure that we catch that um, ovulation correctly. Um, so we usually say day 11 and day 13 after the start of proestrus, just because ideally that's when they're likely going to um, ovulate. If we have a progesterone test, obviously when we start to see those progesterone levels rise into those 20s, we'll say go home and breed your female today. And then you can breed them three days in a row if you want. Like, you know, breed her today, tomorrow, on the following day. We're going to catch her in there at some point. Um, the sperm lasts up to 72 hours in the female. So that means even if we didn't get it exactly right, um, we hopefully can catch her by doing multiple mating. So that's exactly what we're looking to do. Um, if infertility, a lot of people, times people will come in and say, there's something wrong with my female, there's something wrong with my male. But I would say most of the time, it's probably because they're not mating at the appropriate time. Um, and then, I mean, obviously we're gonna do a check on the female and the female, but usually it's because um, the mating wasn't done at the appropriate time and we missed the ovulation of the female. Um, hormonal detection of ovulation is obviously gonna be our best bet to know when to mate. Um, we're gonna look for that LH increase um, that's associated with progesterone. And we're gonna want that, um, ovulation progesterone to rise to make sure that that female um, is ready to go. Again, pregnancy is, uh, we say 63 days. They can be early, so at 58, and they can be late at 68. I'm going to say that um, your larger dogs are going to be pretty much right on that 63 days. Sometimes we see those smaller dogs go a little bit longer, but it's really individual. And so if you have a female that you're used, using for breeding, 
I tell people to keep excellent records, like if records are the best thing you can do to make sure that your female um, is, is on time and doing things. Because you have a female you're breeding regularly and she went early the last two times, guess what? She's probably gonna go early again. And especially if you know that she went at day 61 last time and then day 62 the time after that, I'm gonna be looking for her to have those puppies at day 61 or 62 versus 63 or 64. Um, they're, they have hormonal changes when they're also getting ready to have puppies. We can also do progesterone tests then to see when they're ready to have puppies, especially for timed C-sections, which we do a lot of timed C-sections for bulldogs, um, French bulldogs, so English bulldogs, French bulldogs, Boston Terriers, um, even some of those really tiny toy breeds, like if we have really tiny like teacup Yorkies or teacup Chihuahuas, they're not always able to have the puppies on their own, and so we do timed C-sections. Um, so. They're similar, um, the hormonal changes are similar whether they made it or not, not. they're still gonna get a progesterone level, um, they're still gonna develop a corpus luteum on the ovary because that's what starts producing the progesterone at first to maintain that pregnancy until the fetus takes over. Um, and then the placenta takes over the progesterone. If there's no placental progesterone, that's when they go, it, that's when they go the other way. So the, that CL regresses, the placenta, there is no pregnancy, so there's no placenta pr to produce progesterone, so that fetus isn't producing any progesterone. She's gonna move on in her cycle, um, but this is one reason we can put dogs or humans on progesterone if that's one of the things their body has a problem, we can help maintain that pregnancy. We also do this in horses and in cattle. Um, However, then when this 63 days happen, the placenta, placenta starts producing relaxin because it wants the body to relax because it wants the babies to come out. Ladies and gentlemen, you can think about this. If you gotta get something that's this big to come out of a hole that's this big, you wanna relax. So we want this relaxin to happen. They actually can give this in the hospital to women if they're trying to induce pregnancy, they give you this to get your body to relax. It um, allows that cervix to open up. It allows that vagina to relax. Same thing in dogs. Same thing. It opens the cervix. That vagina relaxes. You're going to see, notice a, an actual droop in the back end of the dog when she's getting close to ready because her muscles back there, her tendons back there are relaxing to allow those puppies to come out. That drop in project, there's also that relaxing also has a drop in progesterone. The fetus stops producing progesterone. So that level of progesterone is high. It goes down. What happens when progesterone goes down? Things come out. So if the progesterone drops, we're no longer pregnant. So guess what's gonna happen? Boop, puppies! That's exactly what we want to happen. So that progesterone drop triggers parturition. Parturition means having birth. Um, so we can do a progesterone test to test for that drop in progesterone level to see if the female is going to have those puppies and that can help time uh, us help time our c-section perfectly um now is my dog pregnant or is my cat pregnant um we're going to be able to palpate that pregnancy at about three to four weeks you're going to start to the doctor if they're really good can palpate the and their dog's not too fat um can palpate that abdomen and they can actually feel like a bloop bloop they're going to feel like little um little marbles or water balloons you're going to feel them about this big in a dog um, about yay big and a cat and you're gonna you can feel those you can feel them like bloop between your fingers and so you can palpate that pregnancy however at day 28 we can ultrasound we're gonna what are we looking for in an ultrasound a heartbeat just like in humans we're looking for a heartbeat we're looking for that flutter and it is really really cool to see um so i have a video here of what it, uh, an ultrasound looks like so you guys can watch that it's super cool i definitely want it's only a couple of minutes so check it out um then at day 45, we can actually take radiographs. The reason we have to wait till day 45 is we have to wait for the skeletons to calcify. Radiographs um, are best at picking up bones. Soft tissue, we're not gonna be able to see in there because she's got all of her um, intestines in there. We're not gonna be able to see through that. So we have to wait till day 45. And usually we tell people to wait till even day 53 to make sure for sure we can see the calcification of those um, the skeletons and then we can actually count puppies with ultrasound we can't count how many we're not 100 percent sure is the uterus laying on top of it is that the same puppy it's really hard to get a number here radiographs we can get pretty close because we can count skulls and spines to make sure that we have the right we can do the right number of puppies the other thing about that's nice about radiographs is we can actually measure the size of the skull and measure the opening of the pelvis on the female to make sure the puppy's heads are going to fit out. And that's super important in some of our um, dogs where 
we're doing those mixed breeds where you have like a, a mini doodle, like a mini golden doodle, and you're breeding a miniature poodle to uh, a female poodle to make sure, and especially when we're starting to get into like F2 and F3 generations, which means F1 generation is your first cross, your F2 generation is, so your F1 generation, you're crossing a poodle and a golden retriever to make a golden doodle. F2 generation is where you've got a golden doodle and now maybe you cross it with a miniature poodle and you have an F2 generation or you cross two golden doodles. That's an F2 generation. F3 would be, again, a step down from that. Um, so that's super important when we're starting to get mixed breeds to make sure those skulls can fit out of the female, the female's pelvis. Or even if you have an oops pregnancy and you're not sure what she got bred with, um, you can check at day uh, 53, measure those skulls and make sure they can fit out of the hole in her pelvis because that sometimes is a problem. Then we have parturition. Parturition is the actual act of giving birth. I have a video of that here. It's pretty cool to see. Um, and it can take 30 minutes to two hours between puppies. We tell people most of the time just to leave them alone unless they're a first time mom. Um, and just kind of monitor. Most dogs can do it on their own, but if you do uh, start to see a problem, definitely call your vet. So what happens if they're having problems during parturition? Um, if they have delayed parturition, so if they have any type of issues, um, first we have what's called primary inertia. Um, inertia just means primary um, exhaustion, we'll call it that. Um, where they're, or pri primary inertia, like where they're not showing the signs they should. Um, they might not show signs of parturition at all. So they might not even progress to the stages. So they might not have produced enough relaxin to relax everything to get everything out. Um, they might not, they might just walk around and pant and never actually start pushing. So those are all things that can happen. Anytime you see dark green vaginal fluid, call your veterinarian. That is an emergency that the blood is starting to oxidize and the placentas are separating from the uterus, which means that the, the fetuses are, the puppies are, are no longer getting oxygen from mom. So that is in a veterinary emergency. You need to get to the veterinarian and get a C-section ASAP to save the puppies. Um, you can give oxytocin in several small doses during primary inertia to get them started. However, call your veterinarian before you ever give your dog anything. Um, we tell people never, never, never give oxytocin until you, until we see at least one puppy mainly because you, she, she may just be having some type of like Braxton Hicks contractions. So she may be having contractions, but not actually ready to have those puppies yet. If you give oxytocin, oxytocin kind of helps relax everything and it causes that uterus to push. If she's not ready to push and she doesn't have enough relaxin yet, she's gonna start pushing, but nothing's gonna be able to come out and you're actually gonna cause more damage. So we usually tell people to wait until, um, they've had at least one puppy before to start giving doses of oxytocin. And we say never give more than two in a row without a puppy. Um, but always wanna call your veterinarian um, before giving oxytocin. Secondary inertia occurs after they started having puppies. And this is basically where the uter uterus becomes exhausted. This, we see this more in big dogs where they, maybe you have a gold retriever and she's had 10 or 11 puppies and she maybe has just one or two left. She's just exhausted. That mama is done pushing, she's tired, uh, her muscles hurt. If you can think about the worst belly cramp you've ever had, times that by 10,000. That's probably what it feels like. Um, I don't know, I've never had children, but so I've been told. Um, in this case, we can use oxytocin or calcium to help, calcium will help strengthen the, um, the they help strengthen the, um, the, the, the amount of contraction, so they don't, make, they don't make her contract, it just gives her more push. Oxytocin will actually make her contract. So again, you need to contact your veterinarian. We usually like to try calcium first and then oxytocin second, mainly because especially if she's still pushing on her own, we don't wanna make her push more, we just wanna give her more strength to push. So um, calcium causes those contractions to be stronger not more frequent, like oxytocin will cause them to be more frequent. If you've ever heard of a woman, a woman being, being given Pitocin, it's the same thing, it's just the human version. Uh, we can control estrus in um, dogs. It doesn't work well. Um, we can use ECG, which is equine uh, chorionic gonadotropin. Um, and we can use that in dogs to try to induce, try to get them to come in heat, but it doesn't always work. Um, usually we find out what works best. If you're trying to get a female to come in heat, put her in a pen with other females that are in heat. 
Now, they smell that hormone. Dogs have a tendency to cycle all at the same time. Women actually do the same thing without knowing it. If you have um, sisters or um, you spend a lot of time with a group of women, so if you have a softball team or a basketball team and you're spending a lot of time together practicing, um, you have a tendency to get on the same cycle because believe it or not, even though you don't, oh, she must be, she must be on her period. I mean, you, you don't, you don't actually smell that, but your subconscious, her hormones make your hormones smell that. And you can actually, you'll sync up and cycle. And that's because, um, that's just a survival thing. Um, because when one female starts cycling, more females start cycling because it attracts the male and then the male can breed them all at once. All their puppies are, um, actually had at the same time. And that goes back to wolves because in the pack, only the strongest hunters hunt and everybody else. And those are actually usually the only ones that mate. Um, the male may mate with other females, but that's one of the reasons that female, that you'll see female dogs have false pregnancy. Um, even if the female doesn't have puppies, she might produce milk. The females in the herd help take care of, or, or in the, um, pack help take care of everybody's puppies. So the male, the male, the alpha male and the couple alpha, alpha females are the only ones that are actually going to have puppies, but those alpha females don't actually raise their puppies. It's the other females in the, um, pack that raise the puppies. And so that's why they all cycle together. It's a survival thing. Um, and so it's, it's just handed down from that. Um, why we see dogs cycle together or cats all come into heat at the same time or lay a group of ladies come into heat or come into heat. Look at ladies, a group of ladies actually all have their period at the same time. Um, the only way to prevent pregnancy is to spay or neuter. Um, if your female gets bred, I'm sorry, you're having puppies. There is one shot that might possibly work to abort a pregnancy, but there's no good abortion method in dogs other than spaying them. Um, because most of the time when we give them that shot, it actually causes more damage. It'll cause damage to the cycle, causes damage to the female's reproductive tract, and she's gonna be no longer good for breeding anyway, so you might as well just spay her. And it's actually dangerous or you can kill them, so we don't recommend that. Um, we're going to, we got, we're going to go to slide. I think it's either 38 or 39 today. We're going to talk about some disorders here. Um, hypersexuality. So you get that dog that humps everybody's leg. Um, best thing you can do is castrate them. If they've already been castrated, they might have some remnants in there. You can put them on progesterone to try to help that. Sometimes it's, uh, it's a habit thing or like a dominance thing. Just because two dogs are humping each other doesn't mean that the one's horny. Um, humping is off, a lot of times a very dominant thing. Batista will Hump Thor or I's arm. He's been neutered since he was six months old. Um, so he didn't even know what testosterone was. Um, but he will hump Thor or I's arm if we're playing really rough with the other dogs. It's just a dominance thing because he's trying to dominate us because we're playing with the other dogs. It's like a jealousy thing. And he's trying to say, I'm the dominant dog. This is my house. You need to do what I say. So that's usually what we see with the humping. Um, cryptorchidism. So cryptorchid means that one or more of the testicles did not descend. Um, Testicles uh, are formed at the same place that the ovaries are. Um, so ovaries and testicles are actually very similar and they're formed in the same area up by the kidneys. Um, in the male, when you start producing, you guys are, when you're, when you are itty bitty babies, you are exactly the same until either estrogen starts being produced or testosterone starts being produced. And then the testosterone forces those little, um, get, um, those, those little either testicles or ovaries, um, to turn into one or the other. And if they're testicles, then they descend down to the inguinal canal and end up in the scrotum. Now they can actually be up in at the time of birth and then they, 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 sh they, they should be up in at the time of birth and then they descend down after birth. So they're not descended when puppies are born, they descend down after birth. Um, so it's usually seven to 10 days after. Um, and they should be, um, if for whatever reason they stay retained, they have, they can have a tendency to drop even up to six weeks after birth, six to eight, six to eight weeks. If they don't see it after that, it's probably not coming down. That inguinal ring is going to close shut and they, they aren't going to be able to fit through. In which case they should be removed because if you leave a cryptorchid dog male intact, he's most likely going to get cancer in that retained testicle, um, because it's not where it's supposed to be and the cells have a tendency to mutate. Um, also, if you don't neuter him, he'll continue to act like a male dog because he's going to be producing testosterone. So um, you just have to go in like a spay, find the testicle, and take it out. 
Um, just some, they can be infertile, so they can have a low sperm count, they can have deformed sperm, they can have an infection going on in the prostate, things like that. Um, we do a semen analysis, so we would collect the semen, look at it under the microscope, see if we're seeing white blood cells, um, missing heads, missing tails, curled tails. Um, you can see all this stuff under the microscope. This is exactly what it looks like under the microscope. You don't have to be on a super high power to see it, um, but you cannot see it with the naked eye. But um, those things can all cause the male to be infertile or not to have good fertility. Um, when we look at semen, we evaluate it on a couple different things. We look for quality and quantity. So is our semen good and is there a lot of it? And we want a lot of it and we want a lot of good. If we have a lot of semen but they're all screwed up, not good. If we have really good quality semen but there's like five on the um, microscope view, that's bad. We don't want that. So we need both of these things to be good. Um, so if you're going to be performing artificial insemination or live cover, it's important to know if the male's fertile, because otherwise, especially if you're doing AI, um, because otherwise you're wasting money. And you could be wasting money on a cover, because um, most people charge for their, your, their male dog. You could be wasting three or $400 on live cover, um, and the male's not even fertile. So we want to make sure it's good. Um, progressive sperm, are moving. So this is just a picture. This is a still picture. The progressive sperm are here. Um, this sperm is dead. You can see by um, he's not moving. Um, you can have sperm that have, uh, you can see sperm that have no heads, no tails. They can have curled tails. They can be missing all kinds of different things. Non-progressive sperm can also swim in a circle. So that's another reason that you want to look at him. This you can see here, the sperm swimming in a circle. If he's swimming in a circle, he's never going to get to the egg. He's got to swim up the reproductive tract to get to the egg. If he's just doing this the whole time, he's not getting anywhere. So we want to make sure that that sperm is going in a straight line. We want our sperm to swim in a straight line. So when we look at semen, it's probably the most important part of the male's reproductive soundness exam. Um, if they have poor quality, they might have really good semen, but not a lot of it. We're going to push you more towards artificial insemination because we can get that sperm exactly where it needs to be instead of life cover. So we could, this may choose how you, um, how you choose to breed your female. It may affect that. Um, and very, um, poor sperm may mean smaller litters. So we want as big a, if in breeding, the idea is to have a lot of puppies to make a lot of money. So we want big litter. So um, if you know you have a male that has um, very poor sperm, you're going to be expecting a smaller litter. Um, so we qu quantity. We're looking for a large number and a large number of alive. Alive. So if you have a really good ejaculate, you might have a ton of sperm in it. You can't even see there's so many sperm, but they're all dead. That doesn't do you a guys darn bit of good. They have to be alive. They have to be swimming. So. Um, in this case here, just by looking at it, this is thick and milky. That means that it's probably got a ton of sperm. The, the, the more milky it's looking, the more sperm that are in there. And then you might have this, whether it's not, it's not, a, it's more clear. However, this could actually be a better collection. If these sperm are all dead, it doesn't do us any good. If these sperm are all alive, this is the better collection. Does that make sense? So it's not so much how many are in there, but how many are alive. And then we look at quality. So are there deformities? Do they, mobility, are they swimming in a straight line? Mortality, so again, are they alive? And then um, blood, blood is spermicidal, so we make sure there's no blood in the sperm, and that can happen sometimes when we collect a male. Um, so deformities, they can have two tails, two heads, crooked tails, that just shows you here. This is our normal sperm. This sperm, that proximal dot is starting to move down, that should be actually up here in the head, um, and you guys can see that's kind of moved here. Coiled tail, detached head, he's got a kinked tail. All of these things are going to cause the sperm not, not to swim or where it needs to go and not to be able to get into the egg. At some point, I'm sure you guys have learned that the sperm all reach an egg and they all are trying to get in all at once, but only one sperm makes it in and that ensures the correct number of chromosomes. And then the female, that, that female, the egg releases a special substance that stops all the other males from getting in. So, um, that, and, that's, and they have that acrosome cap on the front of them, and that helps them get through the egg. And so that's what we're looking for. So they could be missing that acrosome cap, and then you don't have, you don't have sperms that can get to an egg but can't get into it. So um, that's all quality stuff. Um, so they have, they have a head, a neck, and a tail. The acrosomal, acrosomal regions at the top of the head, that acrosomal region is the part that helps get them into the egg, that gets them through that shell on the outside of the egg. That, um, 
post-acrosomal region, that helps once they're inside the egg, that helps start releasing um, all the genetic material, the things that need to go. So these are just all of the head defects that can happen. These are all the neck and mid piece things that can happen. These are all tail defects. So you can see there can be a lot of things wrong. Um, have I seen all of these? No. Have I seen quite a few of these? Yes. So these, they're, they're not uncommon. And just because you see one bad sperm doesn't mean that they're all bad. You just don't want all to have a broken tail or all to be um, elongated or all to be too large, something like that. Um, as long as most of them are normal, that's fine. You are going to find some abnormal sperm in every single evaluation that you do because accidents happen. Um, and we just, those sperm just aren't going to make it where they need to go, but we need most of the sperm to make it where they need to go. So here's a video on the um, semen evaluation that you guys can watch. Normally we look at Duggan's semen in lab. Um, we, I collect him for you guys so you can see the whole process. We, we do a semen evaluation. It's pretty cool. I'm sorry that we don't get to do that, but I will probably do it next year. Um, our next lesson next week is going to pick up. Um, we're going to start talking about artificial insemination. Um, I just want to stop here because this is a really long lecture and it normally takes us multiple days to get through this. So I don't want to overwhelm you guys. So we're going to stop this here. Um, check out this semen evaluation video. Um, if you guys are interested in this, email me. If you want to Zoom with me, I, I have tons and tons of information on reproduction. I, I specialized in reproduction in college. I took a bunch of master's level classes on reproduction. Um, so I'm pretty knowledgeable, knowledgeable about it. Um, so if you have questions, concerns, comments, get a hold of me. I miss you guys so much. So, so much. And I hope that... Um, I hope to be, that I be able to see you guys this summer, and I hope I get to see you guys um, very soon. So um, hang in there. We're almost to the end of the stretch. We're almost to the end of the school year. So um, get a hold of me if you need anything. I'm here for you no matter what. Even if you just need to talk, I'm here. Um, so get a hold of me if you need something. But I hope you enjoy reproduction as much as I do. Fill out the guided notes, and this is the only assignment you have for the week. See you guys.